there's no place like the cube. When people ask me, did you experience more discrimination or things because you are a woman or as a black person, that intersectionality comes into play. But I think as a black person, that is where I experienced most of the isms. Welcome to Joy in the Breakthrough, a podcast where we'll be talking to a wide range of leaders from different generations and backgrounds. Leaders who have found power in being broken open. I'm Connie Lindsay. And I'm Anna Valencia. We are your hosts, and we believe that our challenges can lead to breakthroughs, and we want to share these insights with you. We hope these stories will inspire you to find the I'm possible in you. Today, we're going to talk about ageism and how it's impacted our lives, how it's shown up, and how we've navigated those situations. Whether it's you're too young or you're too old, it seems that age can determine your relevance. Add you are a woman or person of color and the assumptions of you being too old, not enough, too young, keep piling on. How does your age determine your value, experience, or how good you'll actually be in a role? Shouldn't it just be based on your experience, creative ideas, work ethic? But that's not always the case. Especially when people think about folks over 60, they think they have nothing left to contribute, or maybe they have lack of creativity or innovation. Or on the other side, which is called reverse ageism, and I've definitely experienced this, as someone who came into leadership at a younger age, I was often viewed as maybe not smart enough or nothing to contribute, maybe I'm checked out, or even people cracking jokes about my age or how lazy my generation was. On and on it went. Aren't we done with these unchecked biases? Isn't it time to shed these notions and look at folks' performance and what they bring to your teams rather than just categorize them by age? And how does ageism play into making you feel relevant or even enough? So today's episode, Connie and I are going to break it down on what it's like to be underestimated because of your age and how you can reframe it and break through to the joy to define your own relevance and success. Connie, are you ready for this awesome conversation today? Let's do it. I often think about when we have our own off the record topics or conversations, I would say, when we're not recording. And I remember asking you about ageism, relevance, all these kind of topics, and we decided we need to share all this with the listeners. And so I want to start with you because you had such an expansive career and you came in at a younger age into leadership. You were in a male dominated field. You're a black woman. And I know you had to feel that they were underestimating you. Starting at the beginning of your career, can you tell me a little bit and everyone listening how you handled that? I think one of the, sometimes one of the blessings of youth is we don't know what we don't know. (laughs) And we are more willing to try new things because we don't have an experience of failure with a particular thing, or we are comfortable enough in who we are that we say, I'm going to try it, right? I'm going to get the experience. I'm going to learn something new. So early on in my career, you know, I came through in a time when, first of all, based on my background, having been raised and always told that you have to be twice as good, twice as smart, twice as prepared, all those things that a lot of black women, black people grew up hearing from their parents and the people in the community about how we could quote unquote succeed. And yeah, I experienced all those biases, all of the, and for me, it was less age and it was more about race. When people ask me, did you experience more discrimination or things because you are a woman or as a black person, that intersectionality comes into for, into play. But I think as a black person, that is where I experienced most of the isms during my career. Certainly early on, I started working at 21 right out of college and was a supervisor of a lot of women, mostly women in this accounting department at Wisconsin Bell who had been with the company like decades And so right away, they were determined to tell me what I needed to know, or better said, what I didn't know, that there's no way I could possibly be a supervisor because I didn't know anything. One of the gifts that I've always had, though, I think is this gift of discernment and wisdom and a quick wit. So I was able to navigate that by certainly knowing the role that I was supposed to perform and being courageous enough to push back when I needed to, because no matter what, if you are in a position of authority or leadership, folks might try to push back on you. So yeah, I think ageism is always going to be a challenge. And how do we move through that and work through that? One is being clear about who you are as a person. And you've heard me say it again and again on the podcast to have those mentors, coaches, and sponsors 
who can help you navigate, who can hold you and down and support you as you're moving through these crises. I had lots of challenges early on in my career because I was younger and was in positions of leadership and folks want to pick and choose what a leader ought to look like. Did people ever wonder why you're getting promoted when you were younger? Because did they oh, ever sure. think, oh, why? what makes her so special or what does she know? Especially I find people that have been in those roles for a long time and expect I put in my time so I should be getting that promotion. Yeah. When I first started early on, most of the assumptions about black leadership was that we were there because of an EEOC law, a rule or something of that magnitude. It had very little to do with them believing that we had the skills and the talent mm -hmm. to be there and we're as good as anybody. So that was an assumption. In fact, I've told you this story, Anna, many times about how my first manager said to me, you're only here because of the EEOC. Mm -hmm. We'll see how long you make it and whether you will succeed. So that was, hey, welcome to corporate America. <laughs> this is what we think of you and what you won't do. And I just had a little conversation with God about protection and staying humble in it, but also give me the courage to say the things that I need to say. And that's one of the ways that I developed a sense of humor, but also the kind of wit that some people call it diplomacy when you can tell people to go to hell in such a way they thank you for the trip. <laughs> so that, that is a muscle that I worked on, Anna. And uh, I think at this stage of my life, I have perfected that skill. I, <laughs> I will invite so. you to the, to the hot I would place. say so. I've seen you do it. I may Not to me, but I've been around it. And I'm like, Never that is you. a great skill. <laughs> yeah, it's true to do that. And so it, it takes time coming through that. And there were moments when I, it was, it felt incredibly unfair because it was. But then I had another older manager who said to me, and, and I was working in Wisconsin at the time, when I said, this is unfair, he'd say, a fair is a place where they show pigs and cows. We have one in Wisconsin in August every year. This is work. Yeah. It's not fair. Now, that's a brutal message, but it, it helped me to realize that equity is really what I was seeking and justice. Yeah. Because their version of fair meant everybody needed the same thing. And what you and I talk about and what we know is having equity, meaning that I have what I need in order to succeed based on my gifts and talents. I found when I came up in my career, too, yeah. I felt like I definitely deserved those promotions and was ready for it. But moving really rapidly in leadership, one, there wasn't a lot of women coming up in politics at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, 10 years ago in managerial supervisor positions. And so I knew that when I had to get there, I had to prove myself. And I've always been that. That's my work ethic, right? Just how I grew up. Joe and Debbie Valencia's daughters. If you meet my parents, you know my why my work ethic it, it is what oh, it yeah. is. So coming in though, when I came in as city clerk, I was only 31 years old. And I remember walking in like the first day and meeting the director of my journal who had been there for 34 years. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, this is a little intimidating. You've been there longer than I've been alive. And I really had to- You didn't say have that this... out loud, did you? No, I said it in my head. I said it in my head. That's an ageism thing. I, I just caught my bias. Thank you, Connie. But I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, how am I going to prove myself and got intersectionality that you talk about it here I'm coming in as a young woman of color, first generation college student, all the things you bring. And there were a couple times where there were some generational disconnect or biases around my age. What does she know? Talking by the water cooler. And, and, and it got to me. And so then I had to find ways to make sure that I was bringing in leadership that was wise and good counsel too, to help affirm to the other folks that I know what I'm doing. And also I took it on head on too. I think you said something about quick wit and making humor of it. So I found ways to address the elephant in the room, if you will, and, mm -hmm. and talk about it and embrace my age and embrace this. I, I painted as, okay, it's a great innovation, new ideas. We can pair that equally with wisdom and folks that have been there. And so that's always been something that I've tried to do in my career as city clerk is how do we tie those things together where everyone can bring value? But it's, it was definitely hard at the beginning. How have you leaned on other people um, to help you, Anna, develop that muscle and that skill of being inclusive, because that's really what you're talking about. Um, you and I both know that today there are five generations of workers in the workforce, right? There are baby boomers, there are um, uh, Gen Z, uh, millennials, there are five generations and still some silent generation in there. So how have you leveraged that? Because I know in your office there are different generations at work. How have you leveraged 
that as a skill set? That is a great question because I'm currently doing that right now as well in our workplace culture plans. I hired an amazing consultant and she came in and helped right away identify some areas of where we could build out more inclusivity. And then I also had these listening sessions in my office with managers that had been there for more than 15 years and getting their thoughts on where we needed to go. I had a listening session with new team members and getting their thoughts because we do have team members from age 25 to 70 Mm -hmm. and all different backgrounds and lived experiences and different cultures and different ways that we look at different generations. So I've had to really try to be intentional about how do we have points of connection to hear each other, learn each other's stories and make sure that everyone feels valued and what they can contribute. Because a person that's been there for 25 years has a lot of value. They've seen the office over time. And some and the person that's new also has a different perspective, a fresh expe- perspective, maybe bringing in some new skills that we don't know that we need. And so I've tried really intentionally to hold space for everyone, listening sessions, surveys, and then putting that into action so people actually see it happening. And then modeling that behavior as well. So if there's something that I say that is an unchecked bias, I want someone to call me in on it. Maybe not call me out, but call me in, have a conversation by close, behind closed doors. I'm very open to feedback of how can I do better? How can I model that behavior better? And then accept accountability if I do mess up. Hey, I'm, go- I'm not perfect. I'm a human. So I may mess up and I hope you'll give me grace because I want to give you grace when you do. So give me that grace too. But it is very interesting. And The last story I'll say, we had a training with Laura a couple weeks ago, and I love this manager. She's hilarious, and she's a little bit older, and she said, we're talking about effective communication. She's like, well, I just have senior moments, so sometimes I say what I say, and that's just how it is, (laughs) and I loved Laura's uh, reaction. She's like, okay, that is definitely a a uh, a reason, right, but it cannot be an excuse. Hmm. Maybe write it down. Instead of just saying what you want to say, maybe write it down, get it out so it's out there because there's other people who have those kind of things, right? People that maybe just had a baby. They say they have baby brain, whatever. But I think that's also important that when we're talking about workplace culture that we can't use our age as an excuse. It's a reason for maybe needing to learn more or something different, but it can't be an excuse on how we treat one another either. So that was a nice learning lesson for me. You're right because words have weight and they matter. And what might be just an innocuous statement that I make might really be offensive to someone else. And I'm not saying that we have to be in a continuous loop of trying to police each other, but you're right. How we say what we say. I always like to, when I was in corporate, create a culture of curiosity. And so making it okay for us to want to understand each other and ask questions in a respectful way, but to understand what that means. And one of the notions that, one of the things that I'd use is reverse mentoring. I did this both from a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective where we would have people from different cultures mentoring each other, specifically at the senior management level, in order that they could have a better understanding. A white male would receive mentoring from a female of color Mm, so that you could get perspective. And it was curated in a way that was mindful. It wasn't um, militaristic drilling of what is it like and what do you do and what do you have for breakfast? It was really understanding my lived experience in this corporate culture. So what you might experience in a meeting might have a totally different meaning for me because, for example, in in, in the banking culture, people golf and not everybody golfs. And so how do we develop an appreciation for how can we succeed in the organization, defining success for ourselves, of course, but understanding each other's perspectives. And so we would do that. We did that for a year and we actually took our senior managers through it. And it just helped people understand, like you said, a new mom. That's a different experience for her. How do we help people understand that experience? And we're not saying stop the world because you had a life experience or a change in your life. But what I am saying is be curious enough so that as we create brave space for people to really believe who they are, brave space for people to really live into their gifts and their talents, that really is the richness of how organizations and we as people grow. Um, You're one of my mentors. And so I learned so much from you. And I always I have love been when you say that. I feel so it's special true. when you say well, that because well, you're the, mine you, too. <laughs> exactly. Because the definition is a trusted advisor. Yes. When you Someone, asked me first, before you even went to the workplace culture stuff, and you said, who are the people who help mentor you? That was you on day one. It was you and Dr. Janice Jackson I went to and former Senator Toy Hutchinson. 
and even Commissioner Bridget Gaynor, I didn't know how yet to lead and then feel that empowerment that people are going to look at me for my work and know that I belong there because of my work performance and not just because or over overlook it because my age. And, and you, help you do chose that. people, thank you, from different disciplines. My mentors, peer mentors and otherwise, they're from different walks and aspects of life. So when we talk about those five generations in the workplace, there are more seasoned professionals who can work with younger professionals, perhaps on those issues of navigating the culture. But then those newer professionals, technology whizzes, technology whizzes, right? How, do, how can you help um, marry those two things? You'll talk later about some of the things that give away our age. I based know. On- <laughs> Uh, on behaviors. You, you want to talk about that a little bit right now? Yes. I think well, I want to, because we went to reverse ageism. I want mm-hmm. to now look on the other spectrum of your career. Yeah. So as you decided you were about to rewire, you also knew when it was time for your next chapter. But now we talk about too, is like when people say retire, they think, oh, they're heading to the pasture. We're putting them out to yes. pasture. They're going to be in their lazy yes. boy, just putting up their feet and that's it. And I think that's, a assumption people make and a stereotype that's just not true. And I know you're trying to defy that stereotype as well. So I'd love to hear on the other spectrum how you've dealt with ageism and relevance. Sure. And that's just not, that is really a thing now. You'll hear there are books that are being written about the third, third in life, the encore careers that people are having because people are living longer for the most part. Most folks at 60 or 65 are not ready to chuck it all and go lay on the beach and read books and eat high fat food. That is not what we want to do at this stage of our lives. We've accumulated, if we are wise and blessed, enough wisdom, enough gifts and talents that we can be a support to other people, that we can impact society and some of its issues in really significant ways. And I have the good fortune of being a lot around a lot of people who are in that place right now. And you've heard me say this as well, people who follow us on the podcast, that is to be a modern elder, that we are as curious as we are wise. And curiosity is such a beautiful thing. And in this third third for me, it is learning new things. It is, but you're right, Anna, whenever I go somewhere, people are, what are you doing? And I'm like, what does that mean? When I was in corporate, nobody would say, what are you doing now? What I am doing now is being, Because that's really important at this season of my life, more time to just be in that place of being, experiencing what stillness can do to strengthen our minds and our bodies, make me more present for people that I love and for the things that I care about. But there, there are still things to be done, but being focused on where I can have the greatest impact. And there is a tremendous body of work that talks about that, Center for Aging, because we want to stay alive and healthy and well for as long as we possibly can right? So that we can enjoy family, friends, hobbies, whatever that might look like. And for me, it is service. How can I continue to serve based on what I believe God's purpose for my life is in a way that's meaningful for me, continues to bless other people, but also keeps me active, just reading and being engaged. But the beauty of it is I can stop when I want to. (laughs) Yeah, that's so nice. Yeah. Do you feel like at the end of your career, anyone was like, okay, Connie, when are you done? or didn't feel like you had anything left to contribute? Or did you see other colleagues going through something different um, as they decided this rewirement of their face? It's so fascinating. And oftentimes, there are people who are bold enough to ask, when are you going to retire? And my Churchill type answer would be, and how would my retirement affect your life? Because indubitably, it would not. (laughs) He was the one, it was Churchill who famously said to the guy who said, what did he say? He he was at some party or something and the person referred to him, sir, you are drunk. Churchill was known to enjoy a a cup or two. And Churchill said to him, sir, I might be drunk right now. And I'm paraphrasing, in the morning I'll be sober. You will still be an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm paraphrasing that. Anybody wants to validate that. But the essence of it is, don't worry about what I'm doing with my life. Now, there are times when those questions are asked from management because they do have a plan in mind. There could be right sizing or jobs being eliminated. But yeah, there were people who were who would be bold enough to ask that. And I would just respond with, how will my retirement impact your life? The same way, Anna, when people would ask me why I wasn't married after a certain age. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and as women, we know people ask that and I'd always oh, say- Oh, or why haven't you when had the baby? Married, what, or when are you having yes. the second baby? Talk about yes. ageism in terms and, of fertility- Yes. When I was third, I think I was 36 when I had Rihanna, and mm-hmm. I think it's after 35. They call you a geriatric pregnancy. Isn't that something? 
And I'm like, He's, isn't there a better word for that? I'm like, <laughs> right. a geriatric pregnancy. I'm 35 and your <laughs> eggs are dying and you're like, your oh eggs are dying. I'm like, yes, <laughs> exactly. What and we you call know, a men thing. probably thought of that word. I'm sure oh, yeah. it was men. I'm sure it had nothing to do with men. any women in sight. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. We never and say that. And then they make you feel so that. bad. But then I see women, Tammy Duckworth had her second child at 50. Exactly. So we are defying the odds. And I think we have to definitely rethink and reframe that part too. And and thank goodness for choice. That's why we continue to fight for choice. Because for those yeah. of us, I'm child free by choice. And yeah. so we want everybody to have the choice of getting married or not, or yeah. having children or, having or children not. Or and that's not. right. It's that's the choice. work that, yeah, yeah, we care about that. We want to make sure that for younger generations, however you choose to move through life, you get to pick, you get to choose. But yeah, it's I love just your so question. It's funny how Ryan. ageism, I think, and different, we just took it to different parts of our lives. Like yeah, women have yeah. so many things. This is exhausting sometimes <laughs> for is. women. We it have is, so many right. things to navigate here. All the isms. And it's all perpetuated generally, not because we said so, but because someone or they, whoever they are in society, determined that this is what the norm is. Yes, I agree. Right? I will say, as we're thinking through this, I was looking at data and research, and I was like shell-shocked when I saw this data point that at age 40, AARP says that's when people start feeling discriminated on ageism. I'll be 40 next year, and I'm like, what? (laughs) It's already going to start happening. And I do see it, though, when people are coming into interviews whether they're taken seriously or not because of what year was on their college degree, college education, what year do they graduate? You can look at, okay, there's a lot of information on here. Are right. they going to be committed? Even I have to check my own biases. I think, are they going to be committed? How long are they going to stay? And how many jobs of, have they had? How many right? jobs have they had? Exactly. Are they going to be really motivated? And I have to check my own biases when I'm thinking what I should reframe and think about, oh my gosh, how much great experience they're going to bring to this position and wisdom. And and even if they might be in their second chapter, that might even be better for us because they're more focused and they know what, that this is the place they want to be. So I, I just chuckled at that tip because I'm sure. like, or that. And what we do know like, about Gen Z though, Gen Z wants different things than baby boomers. Baby boomers were looking for that security. You stayed at a job for X number of years. The economy, for the most part, accommodated that. Today, we live in a very different world, a different economy. The pace of technology really shifts and changes how quickly we have to adapt. So it's almost Darwinistic. To, it's not survival of the fittest, it's survival of the most adaptable. And so what we see in younger uh, people coming into the workforce, their demands and requirements are different. They want to work for companies that understand their impact on the environment. They want to think about justice as a way of being in the workplace. And while we certainly are in a time politically now where there is this suppression of anything that would have to do with equity, justice, and those things, but that is really, in, in, in large measure, what younger people are looking for when they come to work for a company. What does that brand stand for? What does it mean? How does it represent the things that I care about in my life? Yeah, and I think that goes paired well with a, a wise generation or what those going into their second or third chapters that may want to do the same. They may they didn't have maybe that opportunity coming to the workforce mm-hmm. to be mm-hmm. a place of choice that they can pick a brand or pick a company that felt that aligned with their values. It may have been out of necessity or money financial security or whatever it may need to be. And so in their second or third chapters, that's a freedom, you think, of being able to, hey, I can choose which brand I want to align with my values. I can choose with something that's going to align with my purpose and fulfill me in other ways that maybe my first chapter of my career didn't get to do. And so I think reframing it that way gives it a certain freedom and allows you to reframe any biases that come at you that you can check. I don't know if you've been paying attention. I know you have because you read and are usually on top of all things. But in terms of advertising, I pay a lot of attention to advertising. So when you talk about ageism in noticing how different brands actually respond to different age groups, if you look at some of the commercials now, how they're even talking about some of the physical limitations that can come with aging, watching commercials that are talking about it, bringing that out. And I want to give some data here because it isn't just because brands necessarily want to be nice. There's money in this. So baby boomers control over 53% of the country's wealth, over 53%. Wow. Baby boomers hold 70% of the disposable income. 
baby boomers spend over $548 billion a year, more than any other generation across all categories. And finally, consumers 65 and older are now the fastest growing group of online buyers. So there is a reason to be inclusive for selling your products. And they're different. And we want to speak to everybody. I love the intergenerational commercials that I see. Me too. Um, the I way love that it. we write different abilities. There's this one commercial. I don't remember the product. So whoever that is might want to tighten that up. But there is a father and he's with his <laughs> son who is hearing impaired and they're driving to this waterfall. And they stand on this cliff and the son signs to his father, can you feel that? And the father says, yes, I can. So in that, we're bringing in a person who is differently abled and that is meaningful. So this inclusive nature of it in terms of advertising, there's money in that. And so when you look at the baby boomers, there's a lot of financial um, benefit to be gained to having relevant where you can see yourselves in it, right? You yeah, want to be able to I see yourself in it. Mm -hmm. I feel like you're leading on this too, which I love. <laughs> like you are leading in, no, you are leading in modeling what rewirement can look like. And I know if my mom's listening, you are definitely an inspiration to her because she's also leaning into her next decade of like, what is it that means that aligns with her mm -hmm. purpose? Where can she put her wisdom, her skill set to use? And I think that's that's why I love this conversation about you are relevant at any age as long as you continue to do the work and follow your passion and purpose and think about where your skill set can help the next, even the next generation, whether you're mentoring or pouring into them or you're pouring into your faith community and your church or wherever it takes you, that we want you to be involved. I know that I want this older generation to stay involved because we need your help. We're trying to solve very difficult problems in our city and in our country. And we need that wisdom and that experience to help us shape that or navigate these big problems. And so I just think anyone who's listening today needs to know that you have relevance um, wherever you are in your journey and you have value and worth and to not let these isms stop you or paralyze you with any fear. And for younger people, that the notion of reverse mentoring, get to know um, a person who might be older. Um, one of the beautiful things that I see in some families is, is when you have multiple generations living in the same home, right? It's like Riri gets to spend time with your mom and dad and Riyadh's mom. And so she has the benefit of she'll grow up around elders. She'll yeah. be comfortable with that, right? She will, because most people are afraid of aging and older people, because I think it reminds us that life is not, does not go on in this physical plane forever, and one of the beautiful things I experienced during uh, Girl Scouting is we would have different Girl Scout troops who do projects with seniors who lived in senior communities. And the relationship was amazing. And it wasn't senior, let me th teach the younger person something, how they learned from one another. Yeah. And the bond that, that that builds. Because at the end of the day, how do we spread more love based on what each of us knows and how we show up in the world. And my, my godmother recently passed away and, and she was that person for me that mm -hmm. I never felt irrelevant in her presence. Mm -hmm. I felt like I mattered and she taught by doing. Mm -hmm. She taught by living her life as a, a Christian woman, all of those things, a tough-minded person. And my mother was the same way. There's a poem that says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. For me, they were living sermons. And so now, even though they've gone on, that still lives in me. Letting young people be exposed to older people in a safe way, of course, but yeah. making sure that we can see that just because the person's old doesn't mean that somehow they're deficient. They're different, just like you are <laughs> when you're young. Exactly. I'm going to leave one story and then we're going to come to your word for this episode. Yesterday, we had high school students in city council for this next gen interaction. And they were doing a networking exercise. They had little business cards. They got to fill out. It was super cute. And the person, our trainer, was saying, networking is just meeting new people. If you like to meet new people, this will be a great exercise. And so he made them all interact with one another. And then he said, okay, go and find someone over 40. <laughs> and I was <laughs> laughing because the head of my HR, she was telling me later that this young girl came up to her and said, I think you might be over 40, but I'm not sure you could be 30. <laughs> And she was saying, yes, I'm over 40, I'm 41. But it was so funny to think like that was what they considered older was oh, over yeah. 40. Oh, yeah. And I, he could have said like over 30 or whatever, but he even said over 40. 
And she does not look 40 at all. Um, <laughs> but she's like us, a sister. And so she's she looks fabulous, obviously. Mm-hmm. And but she was just laughing so much. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I'm over 40 now. And this is what the k- kids think that I am old. Right. But I said, no, you're just wise and seasoned. Um, but I loved seeing that exercise of the students going out of their comfort zone and then you know, sharing who they are and learning that skill early on because it'll help them. So as we wrap up today, Connie, I would love to know what word did you pick for our episode today? There were so many words that it could have been, but today I'm feeling like the world just needs a little more love. Mm-hmm. And so the word that I okay. chose was magnanimous. And magnanimous comes from the Latin word magnus, meaning great, and animus, meaning soul. And it literally describes someone who is big hearted. And when I think about all of the isms, if we could open our hearts more to difference, to being willing to accept that we all are beautiful in our difference, in our diversity, to have the magnanimity and the courage to get to know each of us at every age, that allows us to live in a place that is timeless, that is ageless and filled with love. Oh, that is beautiful. I love that, Connie. You always give us the word, not the Greek word today, but the Latin word today. We've got to run through all of the languages. We'll try to come to Sanskrit at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for it. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Joy in the Breakthrough. We'll be with you soon again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. The Joy in the Breakthrough podcast is hosted by Anna Valencia and me, Connie Lindsay. And podcasting is a team sport. So thank you to our dream team, our producer, Anna Deshawn, our editor, Laura Jimenez, our video editor, Joel Ortiz. To learn more about today's guests or the show, visit our show notes on our website, joyitbpod.com and on Instagram at at joyitbpod. Join the Breakthrough is a production of The Cube, spelled with a Q. The Cube is your number one curated platform. To discover the best BIPOC podcasts. Support this show and more like it by joining the Cube app and follow the Cube across social media at the Cube app. Thank you for listening. And we'll talk to you again on the next episode.